Good morning, everybody. Let's stand and worship this morning. Good to see you here, and those that we can't see online, welcome to you as well. Uh, I see that some of our Dodgers fans and our SC fans maybe cried themselves to sleep last night and couldn't make it this morning. That's okay. It's okay. Sports can have a deep, lasting effect on us, but really, we can't do anything to change that. But you're here, and that's what matters. So would you turn around, would you say hi to somebody, learn a name, and we'll get back to worship here in just a minute.
let's continue to worship together your love. Your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through the winter rain, beyond the horizon, with mercy for today. Faithful you have been, faithful you will be. You pledge yourself to me, and that's why I sing your praise. Will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. You father the orphan. Your kindness makes us whole. You shoulder our weakness, and your strength becomes our own. And I am making me like you, clothing me in white, bringing beauty from ashes. For you will have your bride, free of all her guilt. Shame and know by her true name, and it's why I sing your praise. Will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise. Will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise. Will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise. Ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. You will be praised, you will be praised. With angels and saints, we see worthy are you, Lord. You will be praised, you will be praised. With angels and saints, we see. be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Amen, amen. You guys can take a seat this morning. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my Sing always on. 
God, we come to you this morning, and we ask that, uh, that those words that we sing would be true, that you would teach us more and more what it means to give all of ourselves to you, because I don't think it's just me, God. We, we hold on to those parts of us that, that we like, that we maybe want to keep hidden, that give us joy and pleasure, but maybe aren't all for you. And so, God, would you change us and mold us and shape us? Would we be willing to give all of us to you and trust you with that? God, we uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning, to worship in your presence, to be around people who are coming before your throne. Thank you that we have the, the freedom to do that in this country, and God, would we not take that for granted? God, we confess that we need you each and every day, that we come up short, and there's nothing that we can do to put ourselves back in right standing with you, but that it's just only because of the saving work of Jesus on the cross. So God, we place ourselves second to you. We ask you to be the Lord of our lives. We lift up the many needs that are represented here in this community, in this church. God, you know what's going on. We trust that you are working for your good. I pray for Pastor Dave and his family as they're away. And God, would you bring them back safely, help them to have a good time as they're away. We trust you. We look forward to what you're going to do today in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be with you this morning. My name is Austin, uh, one of the pastors here on staff. If you're new here, uh, welcome. So glad that you are joining and getting a little flavor of what uh, Montrose Church is about. Uh, I got a couple quick announcements to bring to your attention. As always, we don't hand out the physical bulletin. It's all moved to a virtual format. So as always, if you would, take out your phone, open up your camera app, point it up at the QR code, 
and open up that link right there. If you're too far in the back, there might be a little card in the seat back in front of you with that same QR code. It all links to the Right Now page uh, if you want to type out that URL. But uh, scroll down through the, uh, the stuff there, the upcoming events, kids' Christmas musicals coming up. Those kids are working hard on that stuff. We got Candy Palooza uh, that's coming up on October 30th. And so uh, that's at both campuses in the morning. So they're just going to give your kids a ton of candy. And then you can just turn around and give that away the next night. You don't even have to keep it. Just tell your kids it disappeared. It's okay. Um, but uh, we also have the Fall Fest that is coming up on the 4th, and that's the evening, that Friday evening, 6 p.m. Uh, beyond the parking lot, just a good community building uh, event. And so there'll be food and games, and kids are encouraged to wear their costumes, and adults, you too, wear your costumes. That'll be fun. But as we're talking about community, that's something that we have to like get back into the practice of doing those things, because it's so easy for us to compartmentalize our lives and just be like, well, we're just, we're doing our own thing now. And no, we're meant to do this stuff together. So I encourage you to be a part of that. Sign up to bring something, uh, and that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, last thing, baptism classes are coming up. And so if you have ever been interested or God's been tugging at your heart to say, hey, I need to get baptized, make that public declaration of the faith that I profess inside, uh, you can find the link to sign up for that uh, on the Right Now page as well. Okay, that's what I got. Uh, I'm going to bring the ushers forward. We're going to uh, pray for our tithes and offerings and continue in worship. God, we love you, and we thank you for the gifts that will be given now and throughout the week. And God, we'll continue to use those for the building of your kingdom. We love you. Amen.
my heart's breaking too And if your heart's beating My heart's beating too And if your heart's bleeding My heart's bleeding too There's nobody, there's nobody but you. Nice. Can you hear me okay? Good morning, church. How are you? Is everybody doing okay? Doing all right? Everybody get their coffee, get a little donut or something. All right, take a sip. Take a sip, high-five your, high your neighbor maybe, even get a little energy going, all right? You don't have to, it's okay, but... All right, Pastor Dave's not here, as you can tell. He, uh, he and Cindy and the fam are in Florida, so doing a little family trip to Disney World. So look at that. It's cool. So we're uh, thinking and praying for them, hoping they have a great time. And I'm excited to be preaching part three of our series, Building Community. Building Community. We've been in 1 Corinthians 12, so we'll finish up 1 Corinthians 12 today, and then Pastor Dave will start with 1 Corinthians 13 next week. And yes, that is the chapter that you've heard at many weddings. Yes, so that'll be great next week. But we'll finish up chapter 12 today of 1 Corinthians. And um, before we kind of jump into our text, which is 1 Corinthians 12, 21 through 30, I want to kind of recap where we've been. Paul's been talking about a few things, gifts, the church, and so just a little recap I think will help us before we jump into our scripture for this morning. Corinth is a massive port city. It's an economic hub. It's very diverse. It has all kinds of temples to all kinds of different gods, right? Greek and Roman gods. And, and Paul strategically places a church there. And he's there for about a year and a half and lives with them and, and, and raises up that church. And then he continues on his journey, right, and, and going to different cities and planting other churches. And, and you can read all about that in Acts 18. But after he's gone, he starts to get reports and, and letters that the church in Corinth is struggling. They're having some problems. There's a lot of division. And so he, he writes letters to them. And these letters are contained in now what we have first and second Corinthians. And so specifically chapter 12, where we've been in this series, he begins with writing about gifts. And because as Pastor Dave kind of talked about last week, the, the people are struggling because every wants, everybody wants the gift of speaking in tongues. And Paul's like, no, no, there, there's many gifts. There's more than just the fancy, uber spiritual gift of speaking in tongues. There's much more to that. There's one spirit above all, in all, and he's gifted every single person with a gift, something unique, something to give. And so kind of before we go any further, I think this is a helpful definition of gifts and talking about Paul's gifts and, that he's talking about to the church in Corinth. So, so check this out, church. Gifts are anything that God has given you that can be empowered by the Holy Spirit to be used for the story of Jesus. One more time. Gifts are anything that God has given you that can be empowered by the Holy Spirit to be used for the story of Jesus. Anything. With our willingness as we place our gifts, our talents, our passions in the hands of, of God, his spirit takes them and uses them for his glory, for his kingdom. And it looks different. Some of us, it's, it's preaching and teaching. Some of us, it's writing. Some people, like the musicians, right, singing, playing music. Some of you, it's working with your hands or working with numbers or, or whatever it may be, right? All have different gifts, and God has been gracious in giving us all gifts. And they will look different. Romans 12, 6 says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. And so Paul isn't saying that some of us receive more grace than others. He's simply saying that our gifts will look different. Why? Because we're different. Because you're different than the person next to you. And that's a good thing. And so we have different gifts. And typically in the church, your gifts go along with the function of, of how you work in the body of Christ, right? In this uh, body when we think about kind of this building and, and also outside the body of Christ. And so our musicians have their gifts, right, week after week. 
and they, and they bless us, right? They take us to the throne room of God, and we glorify God and praise him, right? And, and I, don't know, I don't know about you guys, but I'm thankful for these musicians who use their gifts for the kingdom, right, week after week. And some of you, like me, you know, it, that's not our gift. If we got up there, it'd be a train wreck, right, singing and stuff like that. <laughs> exactly. But that's okay, because there's something else for us, right? We have a different gifting. We have a different function in the church. Um, some of y'all are great with kids, and maybe teachers, or you work in the children's ministry, or help out, or whatever, and, and you know you're good with kids. And some of you know because you've tried, you're terrible with kids, right? <laughs> you've worked in the kids' ministry, and you've, you, you talk to kids, and for some reason, they just keep crying, <laughs> right? You're even saying nice things to them, and they just keep crying. You're like, well, maybe I'm not, I'm not cut out for this. And that's okay, because we all have a different set of gifts and a different function in the body of Christ, in this church and outside these walls. And so uh, before we go any further with gifts, I want to ask you this question. Are you squandering the gifts that God has given you? In any way, are you squandering the gifts that God has given you? Are you using them on, on things that are temporary and things that won't last? Or are you using them to push the story of Jesus forward? After speaking about gifts, Paul uh, launches into this helpful metaphor for how the community of Christ should work together. And he, and he says it's like a body. It's like a body. And what's interesting about this is, is we kind of need to understand the cultural context here because Paul, this isn't some random illustration that, that Paul comes up with. Probably not. Um, at, at the time, there would have been writers, right, in the, in the Roman world, non-Christian writers who, who are writing about people's civic duties within the Roman Empire, and they play a, a role. They have a, a, a part of the body, and Caesar is the head. But Paul picks that up, and he kind of blows up that paradigm of empire and says, no, look, it's, it's the church. The church is, is one body, and Caesar is not the head, but Jesus is. And we all have a specific role to play. We all are a part of the body. And let me say this too when we're talking about church and, and Paul's talking about the body of Christ. I hope everyone knows this, but we need to say this. is The church, when Paul is talking about it, is, is not, is not a, a building, right? We, we go to church, we talk about this building, but the church, the body of Christ, is people. It's you, it's me, it's us. We are the body of Christ. And um, I love that worship song that Chris Renzima, he's a Christian worship artist that the, that the band sang for that offertory. I don't know if you've caught those lyrics, but, but let me read a few of them. Christ has no hands now but yours. Christ has no feet now but yours. Christ has no now, mouth now but yours. Christ has no eyes now but yours. It's us, friends. We're Christ's physical representation in the world, his messengers, his ambassadors, and we all play a role. And your role is indispensable. It's indispensable. Okay, understand a little bit more about gifts and, and the body of Christ, let's dive into our text. 1 Corinthians 12, 21 through 31. If you have your Bible, you get extra points. Just kidding, you don't, you don't, I'm sorry. But it will be on the screen, so. 1 Corinthians 12, 21 through 31. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unrepresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of, kind, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. Okay, so out of our text today, I think there's three things that we can focus on that Paul's trying to, trying to tell the church at Corinth and us today. I'll say that. First is this, you are indispensable. Verses 21 through 22, on the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special 
honor. The definition of indispensable is absolutely necessary. You are absolutely necessary to God's story of redemption in the world. You are indispensable. You're absolutely necessary to this body. Do you believe that, church? I think we struggle with that. I think we struggle with thinking about church like that. Why? Because we've been shaped in our culture to be, our culture to be consumers. And so sometimes church can, can just be another thing that we consume, right? So sometimes we'll say, do, do I need, we'll have the question uh, like this, do I need the church? Do, do I need the church? Right? Maybe we'll wake up and, and ask, do I need church today? But I think, I, I think that's a bad question. I think a better question is, does the church need me? Does the church need me? And the quick answer is yes. The church does need you. The body of Christ needs you. They need, they need your uniqueness and your gifts and your personality. The body of Christ needs you because we miss out on something the church. Inside these walls and outside as we go be the body of Christ, the church misses out on something when you aren't here, when you aren't using your gifts for the kingdom. So you are indispensable. And so Paul wants to shift our thinking. And you might think your, your gifts don't matter. You might think you're one of the weaker body parts, but, but your role is pivotal. It matters so much. You're absolutely necessary. I hope you hear that today, church. You're absolutely necessary. No matter, no matter where you came, no matter how you came in today or how you're feeling, you are absolutely necessary. Uh, you know the term bench warmer? Bench warmer. You know that term? Yeah, bench warmer. Someone who doesn't go in the game, they just keep the bench warm. They ride pine, right? Just hanging out on the bench. Yeah, some of you guys know because you were bench warmers, okay? Uh, and that's okay, that's okay. Um, I, I was a bench warmer in college for my first couple years of college baseball, right? And so I know that bench warmer life. And what's interesting about the bench and being a bench warmer is you kind of start to get comfortable on the bench. All right, maybe get some Gatorade and some snacks <laughs> on the bench. Yeah, I'm feeling kind of good on the bench. I'm, I'm comfortable. And then you hear whispers of, of, of maybe the coach putting you in the game, and you're like, oh, then the fear starts to set in, right? Oh, I don't want to go out there and mess up and cost my team the game, right? I don't want to do bad. So you have this, comfort, uh, this, this, this being comfortable, and then there's this fear of maybe you going in the game, right? I think some of us are on the bench with our spiritual life this morning. On the bench, not using our gifts for, for the kingdom. And, and there's different reasons why maybe we're being a bench warmer. Maybe it's fear, maybe it's apathy, whatever it may be. We're stuck. We're on the bench. And church, God's calling you off the bench today. He's calling all of us off the bench. Bob Goff says this, God didn't give you a dream to keep you benched the whole game. He's calling you onto the field. And you can imagine like a little basketball game or something, and a coach turns to the players, turns to the bench. He says, hey, get in there. Get in the game. And you're like, oh, me? Yes, yes, get in there. Yes. That's God today talking to all of us. Hey, get in the game. I don't know where you've been at, right? Maybe you've been struggling with some stuff, but I need you in the game using your gifts. The body of Christ needs you. It needs you. And again, Bob Goff says, God didn't create any of us to just be practice buddies or water boys. There's no sideline in God's story of redemption, and there's no bench. So what would change for you today, church, if you got off the bench? What would change for your family, your community, the people you surround yourself with? My prayer is that we realize that we are indispensable to God's church, to this body. To God's work in the world, you are indispensable. You are absolutely necessary. So let's get off the bench. Point number two, concern for each other. Verse 25 says, so that there should be no division in the body, but, e but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. When we understand that we are indispensable to God, slowly we realize that others are indispensable to God as well. So what happens? Just like Paul says, there should be no division in the body. Slowly the walls of division come down when we get Christ's eyes to see people as valuable and as a part of this community. So can I live with people who disagree with me? We have maybe different thoughts about all kinds of different things. Can we be in the body of Christ together 
Yes, I hope so. It's hard in our divided world, but with God's spirit, we can. But we need to let God's spirit be louder than all the other voices in our life, church. Whether it's the news station or the podcasts or whatever it is, can God's spirit be the loudest voice in our lives? Paul's desire for the church of Corinth is to understand, hey, you're one body and you have different parts and you have different thoughts and that's okay, that's a good thing. God has created us to be different. And as Pastor Dave mentioned last week, diversity is a gift, it's not a threat. It's a gift. So can I have deep concern and care for people that are different than me, people that I struggle with? With God's spirit, yes, and we should, and we should. All of the body has a role to play in the flourishing of Christ's church. We must have concern for each other. We must. Do we? Out of the pandemic, some of us have struggled with this, right? Jumping back into people's lives, relationship, sharing meals, and we, we struggle with that out of the pandemic, right? And some of us, like, some of y'all introverts are like, well, I struggled with that stuff before the pandemic, right? But the call remains the same for the church. We must care for each other. We must check up on each other. We must invest in one another. And this, makes, this is what makes the body of Christ so unique. This is why when people saw the New Testament church exploding, they were, they were so mesmerized because the church was unlike anything they had ever seen. They had care and concern for all people. Even what the world said, oh, those are the weaker people. Those are the weaker parts of the body. No, no. They're important. They're absolutely necessary. And in Jesus' day, there was all kinds of dividers, wasn't there? Rich and poor, Jew and non-Jew, clean and unclean, all kinds of different stuff. And we have all kinds of dividers today for us too. But can we have concern and care for all people? Not just the people we're comfortable with. My father-in-law is a pastor, and he's pastored different churches um, around the U.S., and he, and he pastored a church in Denver for about 10 years, and that's where Shaylee and I met, and um, it was kind of a, a church of, a, had a big legacy, and so there was a really awesome elderly community, and it was kind of in the suburbs a little bit, and so it had a, a, a lot of younger families as well, and, and my father-in-law has a heart for, for the city, and so he started a, a downtown ministry in downtown Denver. It was called Movement 5280, and I wanted to read... Um, read what the kind of the what they say on the website and the good work that they do so it says movement 5280 seeks to provide a family of support to homeless youth who have aged out of foster care and other at risk young people lacking guidance as they transition to adulthood so just an amazing ministry the church was excited about it and threw resources behind it and 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 it took off it was doing really good things, and, 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 and this at-risk youth, right, the homeless, uh, young people started to show up to church. It was awesome, and there was different meals and programs for them, and, and it was really cool, and the church was embracing them, or I thought everybody was embracing them, right? My father-in-law told me this story a couple years ago. We were talking about some ministry stuff, and he told me this story, and uh, the ministry was doing well. It was about six months after it started, and, and a board member goes into his office, and they're talking. He goes, hey, this church cares way too much about the old people and the homeless people. This church has way too much concern for the old people and the homeless people. And uh, my father-in-law kind of handled it well. You know, he tried to help him understand, hey, you know, we're doing these things, and, and these people really mattered, and we're trying to serve them, and, and all these different things. But, but I remember a couple years ago when my father-in-law told me that I was just, as a, as a young pastor guy, I was like, what? He said, What? Right? It's like kind of one of these moments, you know. I'm like, isn't there a verse about, uh, like, isn't that Jesus, like, like James 127? True religion is caring for the widows and the orphans. And so, and so bless this individual's heart, but they had missed it. Right? As Dave always says, bless that person's heart, right? But they were missing it. They were missing it. They wanted the church to only be uh, ministering to people they were comfortable with. But the church had concern and care for all people. And that's how it should be for us, too. Paul says there's no place for division. Point number three, suffering with. Verse 26, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. 
In Paul's day, in the, in the first century, the people tended to function with this idea of limited good. So if something good happened to you, then something bad happened to someone else somewhere in the world, right? It's kind of this ebb and flow, right? Or if something bad happened to, to, to me, and then something, obviously, somebody else gained something somewhere else. And Paul just shatters that thinking when he's talking about the body of Christ. He says, you are one body. So if one of you is in pain, the whole body is in pain, if your foot is hurting, it's, it's your whole body that is hurting. It's this collective type of thinking that Paul is trying to get across. And it doesn't just go for suffering and hurting. It goes for times of joy as well. He says when one part of the body is honored, every part rejoices with it, right? This collective type of thinking. And as the theological movie, High School Musical, says, <laughs> right? As that theological movie says, we're all in this together, right? That's what Paul is trying to get across. You're all in this together. But there's something unique about this idea of suffering with that Paul talks about. Something unique about this idea. In Luke 6, 36, Jesus tells us to be compassionate as the Father is compassionate. And the Greek word for compassion that he uses there, it's it's this word that literally means mini-bowed. Mini-bowed, right? It means you feel it in your gut, in your stomach. You feel it in your physical body. When people are hurting, you feel that. And that's the type of compassion that Jesus had. When he ministered to those on the margins and those who were hurting, those who had been abused by by the community, right, he felt that in his gut, Not not just in his head, right, but he felt it in his physical body. And that's Paul's charge to the church. We should feel it because we're one body together. So we should sit with people, pray with people, mourn with people, be present with people as they suffer and struggle. We have to be compassionate, feel it in our body. And with this church, uh, we know that but some of us here today and, and people that maybe aren't here are, are, are in that stage of suffering and struggling. And so let me say something to those people is ask for help. This is a community where you can ask for help, and we have all kinds of people in this church that will come alongside you and love you and, and help you and sit with you, right? We don't all have the perfect words and answers to everything, but we want to be present with you in your struggles. In the highest of highs, the church is there. People are near surrounding you and loving you. And in the lowest of lows, the church is there. People are near surrounding you and loving you. That's Paul's hope for this church. That's Jesus' hope for this community. Um, I want to close with this story. And, and you all are like, man, we're getting out really early. Cool. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, it's a little bit of a longer story, but it's so good. So <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Um, when we're talking about being a church that has concern for all people, and realizing that we are indispensable and others are indispensable and, and caring for people that not just we're comfortable with, but all people. I think this is a fitting way to end this message. It's a, a story from Tony Campolo. I don't know if you've heard of Tony Campolo. He's a, he's a famous preacher. And these are his words that he uses and, to describe this moment and stuff. But here we go. Many years ago, Tony flew to Hawaii to speak at a conference The way he tells it, he checks into his hotel and tries to get some sleep. Unfortunately, his internal clock wakes him up at 3 a.m. The night is dark, the streets are silent, and the world is asleep. But Tony is wide awake and his stomach is growling. He gets up and prowls the streets looking for a place to get some bacon and eggs for an early breakfast. Everything is closed except for a grungy, grungy diner in an alley. He goes in and sits down at the counter. The fat guy behind the counter comes over and asks, what do you want? What do you want? Well, Tony isn't so hungry anymore, so eyeing some donuts under a plastic cover, he says, I'll have a donut and black coffee. As he sits there munching on his donut and sipping his coffee at 3.30 in the morning, in walk eight or nine provocative loud prostitutes just finished with their night's work. They plop down at the counter, and Tony finds himself uncomfortably surrounded by this group of smoking and swearing hookers. He gulps his coffee, planning to make a quick getaway, when the woman next to him says to her friend, you know what, tomorrow's my birthday, I'm going to be 39. To which her friend nastily replies, 
So what do you want me to do for you? Uh, throw you a birthday party, huh? You want me to get you a cake, sing happy birthday to you? The first woman says, oh, come on. Why do you have to be so mean? Why do you have to put me down? I'm just saying it's my birthday. I don't want anything from you. I mean, why should I have a birthday party? I've never had a birthday party in my whole life. Why should I have one now? Well, when Tony Campolo heard that, he said he made a decision. He sat and waited until the woman left, and then he asked the fat guy at the counter, do they come in here every night? Yeah, he answered. The one right next to me, he asked, she comes in every night. Yeah, he answered. That's Agnes. She's here every night. She's been coming in here for years. Why do you want to know? Because she just said tomorrow is her birthday. What do you think? Do you think maybe we could throw a birthday party for her right here in the diner? A cute kind of smile crept over the fat man's chubby cheeks. That's great, he says. Yeah, that's great. I like it. He turns to the kitchen and shouts to his wife, hey, come out here. This guy's got a great idea. Tomorrow is Agnes's birthday, and he wants to throw a party for her right here. His wife comes out. That's terrific. She says, you know, Agnes is really nice. She's always trying to help other people, and nobody does anything nice to her. So they make their plans. Tony says he'll be back at 2.30 the next morning with some decorations. And the man, whose name turns out to be Harry, says he'll make a cake. At 2.30 the next morning, Tony is back. He has paper and other decorations and a sign made of big pieces of cardboard. And it says, happy birthday, Agnes. They decorate the place from one end to the other and get it looking great. Harry had gotten the word out on the streets about the party. And by 3.15, it seemed that every prostitute in Honolulu was in the place. At 3.30 on the dot, the door swings open and in walks Agnes and her friend. Tony has everybody ready. They all shout and scream, happy birthday, Agnes. Agnes is absolutely flabbergasted. She's stunned and her mouth falls open. Her knees start to buckle and she almost falls over. And when the birthday cake with all the candles is carried out, that's when she totally loses it. Now she's sobbing and crying, and and Harry, who's never seen a a prostitute cry, gruffly mumbles, blow out the candles, Agnes, cut the cake. So she pulls herself together and, and blows out the candles, and everyone cheers and yells, cut the cake, Agnes, cut the cake. But Agnes looks down at the cake, and without taking her eyes off of it, slowly and softly says, look, Harry, is it all right if... If, you know, uh, is it all right if I don't mean, I want to ask, is it okay if I keep the cake for a little while? Is it all right if we don't eat it right away? Harry doesn't know what to do, so he shrugs and says, "Uh, sure, if that's what you want, keep the cake. Take it home if you want. Oh, could I, she asks, looking at Tony. She says, I live just down the street a couple of doors. I want to take the cake home. Is that okay? I'll be right back, honest. So she gets off her stool picks up the cake and carries it high like like it was the Holy Grail. Everybody watches in stunned silence, and when the door closes behind her, nobody seems to know what to do. They look at each other, and then they look at Tony. So Tony gets up in the chair and says, what do you say that we pray together? And there they are in a hole-in-the-wall greasy spoon, half the prostitutes in Honolulu at 3.30, listening to Tony Campolo as he prays for Agnes, prays for her life, her health, her salvation. Tony recalls, I I prayed that her life would be changed and that God would be good to her. When he's finished, Harry leans over with a trace of hostility in his voice. He says, hey, you never told me you was a preacher. What kind of church do you belong to anyways? In one of those moments when just the right words came, Tony answers him quietly. I belong to a church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning. (laughs) Harry thinks for a moment. And in a mocking way, says, no, you don't. There ain't no church like that. And if there was, I'd join it. Yep, I'd join a church like that. I love that story. I love it. Church, can we be a church like that? Where the gospel takes us to crazy places. Even to the people we disagree with. Wow. Even to the people we're not comfortable with. We can do it with God's spirit. We can. We can. I want to invite the band back up. You are indispensable. You are. You're absolutely necessary to the body of Christ. 
It's not, it's not do I need church? It's, it's, it's does the church need me? Yes, the church needs you. It needs your gifts. In all your uniqueness, every one of you. And then we can get to a place where we have concern and care for all people, right? Not just the people we're comfortable with. But get back to what Paul's talking about to the church at Corinth, the church that explodes because of the type of compassion they have and unity and all those things. And let's not be afraid to suffer with each other, to enter into the, the broken places with each other and not always have, you know, we won't always say the perfect things, but let's just show up. Let's be present. Let's love. Church, thanks for being here. Let's pray. Gracious God, thanks for this morning. Thanks for the chance to gather together as, as your body, all of us different parts, and come together to form something beautiful, not perfect, but, but something beautiful, the bride. Something that God has plans for and, and, and wants to use in mighty ways. So would you help everyone here know deep within their heart that they are valuable, they're absolutely necessary, they're indispensable to your redemption story in the world. God, go with us from this place. Thank you for these moments to worship together. Help us be your people in a hurting world. We love you. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Here am I. great Sunday.